So, so this was the the um, picture from the uh, proposal, which was this kind of uh, three pane approach, which um, I think is more kind of uh, conceptual than I think. I, I, in terms of like the left hand side, this is like a what a tool might look like. The left hand side is very low level. The middle bit is kind of uh, intermediate level logic and representation. And the right hand side is what um, um, a legal uh, person like legal right. Uh, and I guess this, this was a kind of uh, what, what would a fantasy tool look like for verifying or controlling the verification of AI systems. So I guess the first question, what would a fantasy tool do? So I thought we'd go around to them because Gary said what would a fantasy tool do for verifying AI policies? It's quite, quite interesting. I think uh, uh, the tool should be automated to start off with. Should be able to uh, uh, gather the requirements and verify the requirements of the So I think automation is the starting point. That tool should at least suit some most of the example. So you, you talk about that in terms of requirements, that's the kind of key. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the requirements and then verify the requirements that we made as we came up with that. All the way down to the actual systems, or to the kind of um, <coughs> chain there. Yeah, the whole yeah. chain. Um, okay. um, the next one might be David. Yeah, so um, hard question, Bob. Of course, a fantasy tool should do everything. Yeah. And that would be <laughs> fantastic. But what's feasible in our project to do um, and what might we take on? Um, and although we're mixing uh, security and safety in the, in the panel session, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about security aspects. Um, and there, I think we want to do some verification. But um, one of the things that the initial picture from the project showed was this attempt to be a little bit end to end. So you can hear about these security arguments being made in an end to end way. Um, and, and really meaning starting from some high level requirements, but producing something which applies to the actual system being built. So how could we do that? And what might we need to do from a security point of view? Um, and I think I'd like to mention the kind of three stages there, which link up with the work that we started, uh, that Luke was presenting yesterday which is to think, um, and this is a security thinking, a uh, security minded way, but we'll have a connection with the AI. So uh, think about adversaries, threats, and defenses in those, in those stages. Um, and one of the things we talked about when we were starting off the project was whether we were going to be looking at uh, security of AI systems or AI systems for security, because the call sort of allowed us to cover both things. And we, we we mainly concentrate, I think, on talking about the security of, of AI systems, but, um, but we're also at the same time in other research, but in some parts of this research, thinking of AI being used for, uh, for security in some way, and in a way that would help us um, establish some provable properties. So thinking, first of all, of adversaries, I think what's happening in the security space is quite interesting is the work that might have been leading their work together with uh, Microsoft for a while um, on this uh, and they've recently sort of rebranded the results so they produce what they call an adversarial threat uh, matrix for AI so it's called Atlas um, and you can find that quite easy if you google the MITRE Atlas. Um, oh, uh, oh you could do if you like yeah sure well actually I, I could share it here, but I, I don't really want to spend too much time with a long answer to a Bob's short question, actually, and, and let other people speak. So, so maybe, maybe not. Uh, Luca knows I'm looking at some slides that I had ready for yesterday, <laughs> just in case we, we had time in the discussion yesterday. But, um, but that would be a starting point for some security analysis, which would feed into the high level requirements uh, that we were actually trying to prove, um, prove in the verification aspects, right? So, so do you have an invoice, Mitre? Do you have anyone that you're in contact with? 
Um, uh, not, not, not actively at the moment, but okay. if you if you want to, let me know because yeah. I did some research work with the oh, group okay. who were doing that. Oh, so that, that would be great. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. I think we know some. I can. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, talk, let's talk about that. Um, anyway, one of the questions with that is, can we look at um, some of the? Uh, uh, and we, we talked about those kind of attacks on AI systems a little bit yesterday. So not just the sort of evasion attacks, but things like poisoning and the kind of attacks on models, which are kind of inversion type attacks. And these are these are broken down in this matrix a little bit more. But I think what we want to do for the project is find some nice areas to work in where we take some limited capability of attackers, right? Because the whole problem is so huge. So, um, mm -hmm. so can we find uh, a niche that's interesting where we say, actually, we're not interested in the attackers now who have the ability to poison the training dense because that's out of scope for us. But what can we say if we, we assume certain, uh, at a certain point, nothing has been compromised and then take as given, um, you know, the training data is good, for example. Um, so that's, that's a little bit on adversaries. Um, and then on threats, kind of building up on what the adversaries can do and how they can break particular systems, then I think the structured threat modeling is the way that we're uh, thinking at the moment about approaching that. Um, and then there are these interesting questions about how, and it ties quite closely with the sort of way that we might construct legal arguments as well, or um, arguments that, uh, so here, I think the structure, the structure that we break down um, uh, is, is about arguments about the safety or security of the system, which relate to the structure of attacks uh, and maybe also the structure of the system and how we put those things together. So those are the big uh, things that I think we need tool support for. Uh, again, maybe the fantasy tool isn't a, a single tool, maybe it's a suite of tools or maybe it's a way, as we're thinking of programming language uh, approaches at the moment, of putting together some, um, some existing technologies, but, but connecting them up in a, in a sensible way that brings the best tool. So um, yeah, so threat, structured threat modeling there, and they're the interesting question for me. I should put these questions on the slide. Yeah, that would be really good. Can we define some notions of safe operating areas, um, which make sense for uh, using verification, perhaps together with some enforcement? So maybe we realize that some parts we can verify, but other parts we rely on some enforcement at runtime that we verify that this is this is keeping us in this safe operating area, which is the terminology that's so the that interesting thing with enforcement is what you do when it goes from right and yeah. whether that leads to new threats. I think Peter mentioned yeah. earlier about you try and use the car's own safety features features against itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Nice right, so yeah. so yeah. 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 Or exhaustion of resources. Yeah. Um, and then the sort of last piece of the puzzle for the sort of security end to end argument, if you like, is then to think about defenses uh, and how we do kind of construct resilient defenses, recognizing as people said were saying this morning that attackers are going to get in and break things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so probably we uh, we need to think about modeling the way an attacker might break in. So there, um, you know, one thing that's been influential in the cybersecurity world over the last 10 years or so is, is the um, I mean, applied cybersecurity has been this uh, Lockheed Martin on the kill chain idea, which I think Scott knows about as well, which is to think about how an attacker might break things in the system, uh, but how you would thwart them at each stage. So you can see there's a kind of connection to the structure threat. Uh, and then finally, connecting with that, how can we build a resilient system which we might verify using perhaps AI or response? So that's my very long answer because I didn't get to speak much yesterday. <laughs> but uh, but now I, I will give short answers for okay. <laughs> So I've gone, I've gone through the, the order list of the resources on the website. So. And understanding the problem itself is very, very important. Thank you. Um, so I think now we'll move on to Peter. Um, would you like to probably go and share it? Um, what, what's your kind of view of a fantasy tool for AI verification? Um, so thank you. <laughs> so it's interesting to listen to, to, the, to the other uh, panelists in relation to this. Uh, and I've certainly heard a number of things that would be of interest. Um, so, so I guess I started looking at this and thought uh, what I was really after was a, was a tool that proves that, can, proves that, that something can do 
um, at all, what something can do at all times. Um, so from that, we got on to the operating in real time. So a tool that can be operated in real time and looking at a tool that was capable of um, providing evidence. And what did that actually mean? So um, does that mean evidence in the sense of I've proven on a sunny day it might do the right stuff? Does it mean stuff that I could test in court? What does it what would it actually mean around that kind of stuff? And then I started looking at what did you mean by by um, safety and things in relation? Do you, do you mean the safety of the AI? Yeah. Or do you mean the safety as part of the system and the ability to demonstrate it as part of those sorts of things? So I, I guess th those were things that were of, were of interest to me in relation to what, what might a fantasy tool look like. And I gradually sort of came down to looking at this and saying, it's essentially something that allows me to reason. It's something that allows me to reason in, rule, in real time that can actually be integrated with other tools and other evidential systems that I need to be using, can be adapted in real time, is not dependent on things that are operating inside a, a model um, because it's become increasingly clear to me that many of my cyber attacks are actually outside of the model um, and that's that's kind of one of their characteristics that goes with that sort of stuff so a tool would be something that is capable of operating outside of formal models to provide evidence that is useful um, and I think substantiating some of the claims that were made as, as some of the uh, uh, in some of the uh, presentations that have been done so things you know this aspect of talking about whether things are actually operating inside or outside of, a, of, of an area a safe area and that sort of stuff um, it, it's not at all clear to me in digital systems how you're actually able to make those sort of claims um, in the in the universal case you can make it it usually does that, or it sometimes does that, or I've only normally seen that. But something that actually substantiated some of these claims that we were making, so that we actually understood what the evidence was and what the and what the proofs were that were coming out of that. Because ultimately, my belief is, um, I don't want to talk about security. I want to talk about safety or I want to talk about privacy or I want to talk about you know uh, data integrity or I want to talk about an, a different type of objective security is not my objective um, but the security aspects are tremendously important to achieving those objectives and I want security to understand in these tools that it is a secondary objective to, to something else that I'm trying to achieve not my principal objective um, and finally um, with respect to the MITRE Corporation, um, I, I, I like the MITRE Corporation because it really does bring into things the, this, this concept that um, um, the only other place I look at MITRE's is in carpentry and, and in bishops. And I, and I really believe it takes an act of faith to believe that the sorts of things that we're putting together are actually going to provide the evidence that I need. So, so something that takes away something of this element of faith would be a good thing in, in actually being able to provide evidence that I think has got long-term applicability. And I think that's the final element, a tool that actually works over the long term and provides evidence over the long term in the faces of changing, changing world we're expecting to see is going to be essential because otherwise something that actually turns out and is and is is already obsoleted that people have gone around the side of uh, they've attacked it's been over overcome uh, will mean that we can never adapt to that uh, and finally he says something that can be integrated in my other tool chains because if it has to stand on its own i can't see how i will be able to put it into real world use um, so that was my short summary i guess of the things i thought i was interested in in a fantasy tool Okay, thank you very much. And um, Ram, your last. Yeah. So, uh, firstly, I should start by saying that uh, I've always looked at verification from the user's point of view. I don't create verification technology. Uh, I'm a roboticist and a machine learning person. Uh, I've been working in, in, in with autonomous systems throughout my entire career and I've used a number of different technologies that get at questions that verification would like to 
But coming from my perspective and also having done this in industry and tried to kind of deploy technologies on the road in a startup, I mean, exactly the kind of things that a previous speaker showed. My perspective is that uh, the, the biggest uh, difficulty that I face when I think about using tools, which is what then a fantasy tool should address, uh, have to do with gaps. What the, the end user wants, and here by end user, I mean somebody who's thinking about the complete system that's going to be deployed, such as the car that was in the previous example. Uh, the, 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 the things that they would like to see or, or to, the statements they'd like to make about that system um, firstly, they, they have to take into account the environment uh, in a fundamental way. So it's not just about the AI module. It's not just about the car. It's about what the car would do in the complete environment. Now, we, we try to pin that down in various ways, in the ways that designers go about it. But uh, there's only so much that can be done. And there's always going to be uncertainties and unknowns in this environment. So any good tool must somehow factor that in. Now, the obvious way to factor that in would be to uh, you know, have some kind of an overarching model and then to be robust with respect to that. So many approaches for adversarial training and, and various other such techniques that are becoming popular now, they take this view of robustness in general, but that tends not to work. So for instance, if you want an ultimately safe car, then don't switch it on and don't drive it, but that's pretty useless. Uh, and so what we really want is, is to find that middle ground and still be able to say something with respect to environments. Uh, and a, a, a second point that has always struck me is that anytime I've had an actual conversation with somebody who's a problem holder, uh, the, the specifications actually begin in quite a vague uh, setting. So it, it's very hard to pin down and say, you know, this is the precise thing I want. And, and part of it has to do with the environment. Part of it has to do with what is the real requirement that's being formalized. And so somehow being able to deal with the vagueness and the gap between what is the real property that somebody wants to express versus what is the mathematical instantiation that we have had to do because you can incorporate it into a tool. That gap is crucial, I think. And now, how, how does one get at it? Uh, th there are many different ways that people have tried. One could be uh, that they enumerate a large bank of scenarios, and then they situate all statements with respect to scenarios. Another could be that uh, you know you somehow figure out how to go from uh, you know natural descriptions, almost natural language descriptions down to things uh, that can be extracted from them. Uh, so I don't have a, a strong opinion on what would be the best way to do, except to say that I think that's an important ingredient of an actually usable tool. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, from my point of view, actually, uh, although I, I see the reasons why one would say that, I, I don't mind if these tools are not particularly efficient as long as they're not terrible. What I mean by that is it's far more important that the tool be expressive and able to deal with these kinds of phenomena than it is for it to run exactly in real time. So, you know, five times, you know, slower might be acceptable if it actually did the job. In some sense, throwing a little bit more resource in other ways might be much more acceptable than a tool that makes, that forces me to make assumptions that are kind of crippling. So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to have a discussion and chat. Okay, thank you guys for do any of the panelists want to respond to the points made by the other panelists. Okay. There's a number of themes that came out. One was um, I guess evidence and the importance of uh, collecting and sort of um, maintaining the evidence over time. I mean it's sort of out. In you know, programming terms, this is kind of your refactoring your, um, uh, your your overall system to maintain something while adapting it. And it seems like that's quite a common uh, theme: is kind of longevity of whatever kind of knowledge you've built up and formalized with the tool. Um, I guess the other thing is that we don't really know what we want them to do. Systems and uh, getting hold of the specifications is very hard.
there any uh, questions on this slide? May I share a screen briefly? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. People are sharing. <laughs> So this is kind of the problem set that I think you get when you start to, the reason I emphasize the evidence and things of this nature in terms of the tools, that the, the shifting of things from one place to another, the, the, the lack of evidence that the tools are providing to put into the systems that I'm looking at and the lack of the ability to access it. Um, is causing me these sorts of problems. Yeah, I, this this was a mythical 2031 article, not a not a real one, I have to say. Um, but it's is the sort of thing that that I I think the systems are important to us. I think yeah, AI is 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 going to prove to be essential. This how do you how do you move from one thing to another? False evidence where we where we we think it does something, but then it turns out that it turns out we don't have enough to prove that and the entire owner shifts in the system that we've got in relation to that. Sorry. So that, that was what I was trying to, this is the stuff that's in my mind when I'm, when, when I'm looking at where do I want to use the outputs of these tools and what have they got to contribute to? And I guess it's why I'm very keen on this group as a, as a, as a, as a crossover between the legal aspects and the evidence aspects and the and the tool aspects of what you do with AI and what what constitutes that kind of stuff. So it's kind of if you come out with something formal and stick it in the stick it in the side there and I can't use it. I, I, I'm with Ram on it. I, that's not very much of use to me. If you come out with something that gives me evidence and it's less formal than that, I need to know what it actually means. From the tool, what what is the, how can I use it? What 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 where would I be using it? Am I talking about a fifty percent probability that that was correct? Am I talking about yeah? You know, what what am, what am I talking about yeah, in relation to these sorts of things? And it's that it's that experience and what we mean in our reasoning that that I was that I was right kind of interested in. Um, so apologies, that was. Um, I finally got away from the mobile phone that was crippling me previously. So, yes. so that, that was kind of the stuff that I was, I was interested in, in relation to this um, and the tools that go with that kind of stuff. Is, is, is that helpful at all or not? Yes, it is, it is to me. I had um, another question lined up, uh, which was who is the actual user of these tools? So. I kind of phrased it previously as what would you like to use, but in terms of um, evidence, I mean, the actual end user is going to be prosecutors and juries and judges. I assume well, surely it's also going to be engineers who have to defend themselves. Yeah, well, yeah. or debug it and find out. Uh, what, what it, yeah, in relation to, to that kind of thing. So we're not, we're not just building tools for, for people who are going to buy them. So. And also there's the, the attackers might have access to these tools as well. If the uh, specification for the system is um, available, then they can download the tool off GitHub or whatever and uh, run some simulations to see where it goes wrong. Maybe I can say a few words. I, I think this is uh, it's it's really critical to think about who the users of any tools that we build might be. Um, also picking up on something Ram and Peter both said, I think one one thing that maybe we're tempted to do is to get a little bit caught up on the notion of verification and verifying something as if it's an absolute thing. Um, 
but actually the activity of using the tool by whoever uses it to build up the evidence base might actually be the most important um, takeaway from having such a tool uh, or suite of tools. Um, and if, if different kinds of people are able to use it, then uh, we need to think about ways that they might actually interface themselves with the tool. And that's a problem that I'm not sure we're going to be able to take on in this project, but, um, but I think starting to think about it might be a good thing. So I think having this list of potential uses is yeah, and good point. My, my experience with these sort of tools where you use it as a vehicle of thought, you, you end up with a very good mental model yourself. And then it's a lot harder work to communicate it to someone else. So you end up with a good understanding. But it's also a tool that can to be of like with sort of data formats for communication. Well, these structured safety case arguments are a little bit like that. So, so having a way of breaking down an argument into pieces and then some parts of the argument might be answered by providing some evidence, which is actually a formal proof, but other pieces might just be appealing to law or appealing to other, other forms of evidence. You can kind of rely on that kind of argument. And the tools that can be put support that way of um, reasoning. Yeah, do you not think we also need to tease out some of these um, differences between um, sunny day type situations, uh, which I think goes with 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 what other people have been saying there, and 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 what happens when you're under attack, or what happens when you when you get emergent properties that you weren't expecting in relation to these these sorts of systems, yeah. You know, and what is it that you actually think your your tool is aiding you in making a claim about? So so making sure we understand where those claims operate. Um, and, and I know him well, so, so Alan, please forgive me for this, but in his presentation, he talked about the last problem that people were trying to solve, uh, which is always nice to know that we're that close to, to automatic automatic cars and things, um, was, was this aspect of, of, so I'm running lots of data and finding all of these things out, but your attacker will use the one that you didn't use. It's always the black swan type thing that you got in relation to that which isn't to say you didn't need to do this work in order to figure out, you know, can this do this in, a, in an acceptably large set of, set of environments? It's more a question of, so that doesn't then allow me to move over into the cyber environment. That doesn't then allow me to move out into the, in, into the threat environment. So if you want to make security claims around that, that starts to be exceptionally difficult to do. And realizing that, you know, that doesn't mean that the evidence wasn't useful in the first place, but it does mean that people are making claims that um, that they shouldn't be um, in relation to these things. And it seems to me that there's a lot of that that I'm seeing in relation to, to digital tools at the moment and complex systems. Um, and I, I would like us to be, you know, I would like us to be understanding where where we think we're fitting in relation to that. Should people be more specific and specific in the claims they're making? Like, you know, obviously, you can't claim it's secure against everything or safe against everything, but you can say, well, we've tested and verified it in these scenarios, so we think it works. Um, so, so I, I think they should, because if I could make you a fly on the wall during a conversation that we had uh, with the UK Auto Council, we went through. And we worked through a lot of these cyber attacks and, and how did that look and all the rest of the things. And, and we went through discerning what we wanted to do and following their normal engineering mindset. Um, the point was you got to a situation where, okay, if I can detect it far enough, if I can understand it, if I can do, if I can act on it quickly enough, that's, that's what I need to have in place. But we did, a, we did a thing there that said, but if you had unlimited cash, you'd still only get to 50%. And that won't be enough evidence to take the case and to court and say why well, you're safe. Yeah, and it's that it was that realization of the gap that 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 started to cause them to believe that cyber was a really important element on what they were looking at, not just something they could ignore and push to the sidelines. So I, I think that aspect of starting to understand what are the limits of what we can claim with these sorts of tools, not because they're bad tools, but because because you fly in the face of, of maths, you fly in the face of all the rest of the stuff that we've, we've learned over a hundred years. 
Yeah, that is a really important thing for people to understand and to, to get a consensus amongst the various stakeholders that you've put up on the screen. It feels like it's almost a marketing problem. You need to um, educate the, the, uh, the end users or whoever they are that these claims are not complete. And no, no one's going to believe that they're going to be sold. Well, no one at the moment would believe they could be sold a car that couldn't crash. But you can imagine this sort of claim that is implicitly made. And uh, maybe the regulations shouldn't just cover the actual construction of the car, but their marketing as well. Yeah, I, I think that's an extremely good point uh, because um, I mean, if you just look at public perception of all the statements about anything in the news today, uh, you know, the actual semantics of what the scientists said and what is understood by people and policymakers are, are quite different. And it's not really, if we are honest about it, the fault of the public, because uh, in some sense, messages must be crafted and conveyed in a specific way if we really want that to be accepted. Uh, so if we have a, a, you know, a highly technical and obscure way of uh, stating properties and ensuring it, and if, you know, if, if it, it has to be that delicate, then it's, it's just not a good proof. It has to be something that holds up in the conversation much easier. I, I think there's a really good point there, isn't there, Ram? Because because very often what we do is produce evidence, and we um, and and you produce this evidence pack that says, "Here you are. This is why I thought it was okay." Yeah, and the starting position of the public and the courts is, "But the car crashed." Yeah, and then you get into a discussion of, so given that the car manifestly crashed, and that was your evidence pack, why did you believe that evidence pack? was in any way relevant to the to the potential outcome and it's that gap that we don't adequately address yeah you know, we we do a perfect circular job often but we don't but we don't actually say but you can't yeah you, know, you know we can't give you 100% we can't yeah you know, we don't give any evidence about those sorts of things um, and i think that's um, that's often um, that's often our own fault you know because I don't think we necessarily understand that ourselves when we're doing those these things. Yeah. I think that's less true for security nowadays, though. Um, people are accustomed to hearing about ingenious attackers breaking into systems, right? See, see I, I don't see it that way, I must admit, because when I hear people, so you're right that people talk about ingenious. To, so, but when you're talking about the security and things, you still get people talking about secure by design without actually working out secure against what? <laughs> yeah, the phraseology and things that goes with this already encompasses the, the, the gap, as it were, and encompasses the problem. So I think we're just about out of time. I, um, thank you to all the panelists for their contributions. I said we want the last word. Just uh, ask, yeah. I have a final question maybe to everyone. So we spent this year in the group uh, trying to understand what can be done uh, in terms of the tooling. And it doesn't look like we'll be able to do all the magic stuff we wanted to do. It's very likely gonna be, maybe we will focus either on a tool that does verification of neural networks nicely. And we could focus on the fact that we'll it will be something like what Marty showed uh, yesterday at the end, that we'll be able to give any neural network, it could be neural net that, uh, um, for example, for attackers, so it could be neural network that does vision, or maybe neural network that does NLP. Suppose we can handle that, any type of neural network you give us, uh, you specify the property, and we give you a nice tooling to specify the property and ship this to some verifier. So this is a fun, maybe a comprehensive tool for verification of neural networks only. Or maybe we'll be able to hook up to Jonathan's work, so next session topic, and do something interesting for legal requirements and security somehow. So that's the second kind of tool. Or maybe there is a third kind of tool which will look rather at the broader infrastructure, because this, this was not part of the project. One of our PhD students was looking into using ACTA to specify some meta properties on top of AI planners. So this is more autonomy that Goodman was talking earlier on. So some tool that does 
automatic planning, and maybe you want to specify extra properties on top of it. Um, maybe I'm not even listing all possible tools that we could create, but we definitely would not have time to, to do three nice tools or four nice tools. But I just quickly, like it's a matter of my choice. So, what would you, if you, our panelists, would have liked some tool from us in two years' time? What kind of tool would you have liked? Assuming that it would have very possibly narrowed down functionality, it's not going to be for anything in AI, but either for legal requirements, security, you know, natural infrastructure. What would be your preference uh, or priority area? To like? Except for David. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to excuse myself from that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I think the, um, something that uses natural language processing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you think that's going to, but then NLP uses neural networks. So it will ship you a tool that can do transformers that are used in NLP. That makes sense. Uh, I think the Okay, the, the neural network uh, recognizes the language. Yeah, so. But that's because you want to um, to take the output of that and use that as a, as a way of precisely describing what those regulations or whatever they say. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the long goal. I, I think I'd be interested in something. In, in So I do agree. I, I, all of the tools that I've listened to are interesting. Uh, but they, but I think what is most important for me is understanding understanding the environment into which they have to fit and how they and how they operate. Uh, I think that that will help me to use the tools that you're talking about. So on your on your thing you've got up here, yeah, I, I am certain that I must be able to recognise the highway code. It's more a question of so you need to fit this into a system, you know, where 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 somebody is able to override this when it goes wrong. Be that another another autonomous system, be that a, be that a person, you know. If I'm stuck at a red light, I need to be able to drive through it when the red light's not changing forever. Cautiously, yeah. That that those sort those sorts of things I think are are um, that that would help me a lot to make more use of the to make more use of what I think are really good and useful insights and tools. It's also the, the problem. The, the highway code and the road rules also interact with other really wonderful pieces of law that you know don't necessarily on first blush look like they relate to traveling around in a motor vehicle so it could be property law it could be um health law, it could be privacy law. There's, there's all these other ancillary laws that somehow have fingers that can wander in how do we ensure that they're respected at the same time Would you have a preference for any kind of tool? So I, I, I overall think that uh, what you have is pretty okay. The most important thing is to find a domain that uh, do not have very high input dimensions. So, and uh, the input has features that it can be physically interpretable, such as you can, you can formally specify things. So for tones driving, it is very hard. But uh, for example, there are also a lot of numerous automotive uh, parts where they would like to replace uh, some intelligence by, by a data-driven approach. And surely you can try to leverage, for example, the network inside UK, for example, a lot of uh, tier ones or tier twos, try to approach them to, to see if they, you, you, the, the thing that you have can bring benefit. Yeah, I think if you're resource constrained, I agree. It, it's it's fine to have a small domain in which you're operating, but then to show the complete feature set. And in addition to what everybody else has said, which I mostly agree with, uh, I would say it's kind of important to go back and think a little bit about the connection to how you're communicating uh, counter examples or you know findings of the tool to the end user. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to move on to the 
the law and AI. So before we move on, I just want to say, I know that some people are going to go uh, from, from online. And just thank you for joining in a bit more short form. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you again. Goodbye. And you people who just joined, hello. <laughs> Okay, but we're going to change over just for this session. Sorry? Uh, shouldn't. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it, it, it's sad. Uh, could, could someone repost the, the slide only? Because it's some funny, people have come. Listen to what the last chap said. All I think of in my head is Therac 25. When people start talking about replacing a physical system with a piece of AI software, okay, going to so do all my thinking for me. I just see Dirac 25. So, just everyone, it's it's the start of the legal session, and Dorcas will um, once again say what the question is for the panel because I can't quite remember the top of my head. Okay, so, I'm Matt coming in. Order. Order. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's just don't the next one. Let's wait, don't make this everyone sort of sounds together. Yeah, okay. I think we should uh, yeah. um I I bloody hell why do you get in the way of <laughs> or do I get the slideshow started? Um sorry slideshow I I I have I shared my slides? Yes, you yes, yes. yes. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's exactly my problem. And um, the panel from the Zoom is exactly on top of the part where I would oh, switch to. Okay. <laughs> that is exactly. Well, yeah, actually, you can the see the bottom see. In the There's a little one way down the bottom. Ah. The, 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 first, the first thing to the left. Reading new slideshow. Yeah, yep, got it. Thanks. Okay. Problem solved. Yeah, just um, to get us started, and also because I was suffering the uh, David problem, not being allowed to speak yesterday and not hearing my voice, which is always extremely irritating for me. <laughs> I would just say a few few words to introduce how I thought about uh, framing this question. And and one thing that struck me when I was listening to the law papers yesterday as well is this to a certain extent uh, how history is to a certain extent is repeating itself. So. Back in uh, the 1980s, we had a paper by uh, Sergo and uh, Bob Kowalski, extremely influential, the British Nationality Act as a logic program, uh, driven by a concern about um, opaque, uh, arbitrary decision making by humans, black box humans, which are full of biases that we don't fully really understand. So by turning this into an ex executable program, um, we can design out these problems from the legal system. That was a very popular idea in the 1980s. And uh, just, uh, I think, last month, Bob Kowalski and collaborators published another paper, uh, 2021. And uh, this time around, it will all be different. Uh, because even though these ideas in the 80s didn't quite get lots of traction, we now get something reasonably similar. Um, and it echoed, I think, with some of the uh, talks we had yesterday, the need to Think of legislation in a different way, have it more intelligible, um, have it in a controlled English that then can be more or less straightforwardly translated into, into code. A slightly different formalism used here than, than the ones we, we saw yesterday. But again, this is, uh, I think, becoming a, a, again a, something of interest. And uh, one of the questions for me is also what has changed now? Uh, why is the situation we find ourselves in in 2021 different from uh, in 1980s? What can we learn from the shortcomings, and the problems we experienced from the 1980s? And um, very quickly, um, picking up on three issues. One of them, um, Scott just mentioned, the legal system is primarily a system. Uh, all laws interact with all other laws in one form or the other. There might be significant differences and distances between them, um, but there's always a potential that some clever lawyer spots a new definition in labor law, and in the light of that definition, totally reinterprets a provision from road traffic law. For instance, the liability of someone who is employed um, by a um, by Uber, um, for instance. So, so the, the um, hierarchy that, that we have here um, is uh, a sort of 
attempt to structure a little bit the material and from the legal perspective, you face a similar problem that, that Katya mentioned for the AI perspective. Can we identify aspects of the law that are sufficiently isolated to give us interesting problems, but where we just don't distort the domain too much by at least for the moment ignoring everything else that is going on? Um, is, is there such a thing? Is there, is there value in? identifying an isolated piece of legislation that is a reasonably technical, still very interesting, has interesting properties that benefit from formal uh, rendering. And we don't also have to model the constitution or the rules of procedure, all these laws and the top of that pyramid that are extremely difficult to capture computationally because they are full of extremely vague expressions. That's where you get fairness, respect for human rights, which don't easily translate into, into code. So, so is, is there a, a specific domain also to you from industry that dominates your thinking where we don't need necessarily to um, draw in other pieces of legislation? And then the question is, uh, who, who is actually the legislator here and what does this mean again for industry? Um, we have a traditional model where laws are made primarily by parliament and interpreted by judges and in a common law system that creates its own laws judge-made law. And in both of these approaches, we have methods for scrutiny and challenging. Um, there's a process for parliament to make laws. They have to be documented in a specific way. They have to be publicized in a specific way, and they can be criticized and challenged, for instance, through the courts. In the court system, we can appeal against the decision. Uh, and again, they have to be published in a specific way, in a specific format, and follow specific procedures. Increasingly, if we are now looking at AI and the attempt to build rule compliant AIs and, and build these legal rules into the system, computer programmers have to make interpretations that in the past were either the reserve of parliament or the reserve of the judiciary. And again, we saw this yesterday in some of the talks. If you render a very complex piece of legalese into something that is more accessible, you will have to make some choices. And these are choices that in the past required a specific type of authority. So how can we preserve this? What does this mean for a programmer to make these type of decisions? How do we document them? Do we need new standards maybe for documenting programming and design choices? Do we need a new method of challenging them and putting them under scrutiny just in the same way in which we can appeal against an act of parliament or a statutory instrument? So the question becomes, again to, to industry people to, to co computer scientists if you suddenly find yourself occupying a, a role that previously had been done by totally different profession what does this mean for you as a professional how can we help you to do this more responsibly are there ways to to, to facilitate this to better technology but also how can it be documented and um, challenged if necessary and uh, then we get new audiences for law uh, that's, a, that's a quite interesting question because I also ask it typically for my first year students when I teach them jurisprudence. For whom do we have laws? Who is the accuracy of laws? And typically, what students are saying is well, the people. Yeah? Laws give us the rules of behavior, that is their main function. And I doubt this, or it's at least not, not quite as straightforward as you might think, because some people would say actually laws are written for judges. Um, there's a vague feeling that people also should know the law, but most people know the law without looking into statute books. And when I went in this morning to, to see you all, I didn't look up through the criminal code. What am I not allowed to do today? <laughs> Killing, okay, off the list. Bribing, not allowed to do that. Uh, <laughs> so I don't do that. We, we, we normally have some, some basic intuition. We, we don't need to look this up. The people who have to look up the statutes are judges because they need them to justify the decision. And there's a very radical version of that by Binding uh, and others who say, only judges can break the law. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, we've seen yesterday in the, in, in the, the post in the law papers, the law has a form, if you do X, like kill someone, then the consequence is you get imprisoned. So if you kill someone then you, and you get imprisoned, then you haven't broken the law, you have fulfilled the law. The only person who could break the law was the judge who didn't convict you. So the accuracy of norms are law judges, and that's why laws are written the way they are. 
And increasingly, um, there's also algorithm for regulators. It's that regulators need to do what they are doing, certifying things to specific standards. Not the, not the driver, not the manufacturer. It's, it's the regulator who has to understand the laws. And then in our AI field, obviously, big interesting question is the audience now, the AI itself. Should the legislator talk directly to the system in a way that the system understands it? And it obviously matters. I write the code differently. My audience is the ordinary citizen, the judge, the regulator, or an AI. So we get very interesting um, developments at the moment that say, also to, to prevent the first problem that I mentioned, parliament should change the way they enact certain types of laws. We still should have a natural language version, but they also should have a sort of positive translation, a good version for it. Big discussions going on at the uh, commission. I just attended a talk there two days ago. Um, should we think of new ways to incorporate directly code into the legislative text? So to avoid the problem of giving that duty to um, developers who are not authorized for it. So that's for me the sort of really interesting problem space in which we are in. And at the moment, with these new actors, both in the terms of lawmakers, but also in terms of law audiences. Um, this is just one uh, idea that, that I'm still very fond of. It's a um, project that um, was developed at the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology. And again, it resonates, I think, quite a lot of the things we heard yesterday from, from our contributors. Um, they tried to deal with um, engineers who want to develop a privacy law compliant smart grid for uh, cars that can send the energy back into electric grid and out of the electric grid. How can we do that without an attacker getting um, sensitive data? And their idea is you're sitting there as a domain expert making your decisions about the design of that system. And then you have a sort of clippy in the background, an annoying clippy, but this time around clippy wears the big. And it pops up and says, it looks like you are trying to violate article six of the GDPR. Um, is that really what you want to do? Here are some ways I could help you doing this if you really want to do this, but here are also some ways you might want to do this in a law compliant way. So, so the legal representation, the type of code-based representation that we saw yesterday, are not running on the side of the AI. Um, they are not used by the lawyers. They are part of the design environment of uh, a computer programmer. Uh, and whenever they make a decision that is salient from a legal perspective, the environment spots that and says, oh, actually, what we are suggesting here shifts personal identifiable data to that other point. You haven't made sure that this data carries uh, its consent form with it please make sure that um, it is connected in a one-to-one -one, um, verifiable way um, to the respective consent form. So that, that's me, that's what I thought uh, and took out of um, the, um, um, the, 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 the calls, uh, 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 the, the, the talks yesterday, and also in, in terms of ISAC and it's, uh, what it tries to achieve and, and hopefully, uh, simply this as treatment as, as a provocation for our other panel members. Uh, I, I would love to hear obviously your thinking um, for the industry folks in particular. Are there individual pieces in your experience that are of legislation of regulation that you find difficult to comply, which are not too broad, where, where that sort of solution might, might be of help? And, and those of you who come from the legal background, uh, how, how does this resonate to you when you? Think of it in terms of um, legal knowledge representation, for instance. That's me. And um, with that, I open it up to the panel. And uh, I actually don't have, I should have thought about the speaking board, or shouldn't I? <laughs> but uh, I, I see Vaishak simply as, as, as the first uh, image popping up on my screen. Do you want to? Um, Take over at this oh, that, that, that's a tough. Uh, that's tough to put me on the spot, Mercad. Uh, um, given that I'm not uh, a lawyer, but as you said, uh, you're opening up the space also to computer scientists. Um, I have to say, I really like uh, Bob's work. I think that was a great piece of work that did back in the '90s. So I think, uh, you know, one thing I want to say is that uh, even though there's a lot of uh, emphasis right now on issues like fairness. Uh, 
um, in, in the machine learning community, um, you have to realize that uh, the recognition that systems are unfair, even from historical data, is a human observation. It's human logic that's telling us that uh, unbiased uh, machine learning basically is one where, uh, for instance, the genders are balanced or equi are made equitable, similarly to race and ethnicity. So in some sense, um, uh, I mean, at least I'm not, I mean, not going to as far as to say what, what the law needs to be, but I think the idea that human intervention uh, is needed is true for every, every possible AI instance, everything from machine learning uh, to formal logic. Uh, it is human intuition that is telling us what it is that we're looking for, what kind of properties that, that should the system solve. Um, certainly fairness constraint is human ingenuity at, at its best. Uh, and in many cases, when they analyze historical data, uh, it is then they found as, as you started off by saying Burkhard, that uh, it is uh, black box humans completely biased who are creating many systems in place from banking to, to lead, whatever citizenship, uh, acts and so on and so forth. And it is uh, by the analysis uh, from historical data that we identify there is uh, a lot of potential for bias. Having said that, um, uh, I, I do think that uh, uh, certainly I mean, again, I haven't kept uh, kept up to date with every possible uh, law coming from the EU or the UK regarding technology, but certainly GDPR has had a fair set of criticisms. Uh, as you're aware, there's been work uh, by some members of the Turing who have looked at GDPR and pointed out that there are numerous flaws, at least when it comes to trying to regulate um, algorithmic decision-making. And so I think there needs to be um, certainly a deeper kind of uh, communication between say scientists and legislators because often when you posit some kind of condition that the system should satisfy uh, the challenge i think uh, with many machine learning systems is that you don't have such rigorous guarantees about what the system is doing this goes back to all of the talks we had yesterday um, i'll stop now i don't want to keep giving a long answer for a short question and give the other panel, panel members but i can expand it if, if we come back to any of these points later on yeah, thanks thanks a lot Oops. Thanks a lot for that. Oops, sorry. Oh, what is this? Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, th thanks a lot for, 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 for that. Um, and well, one thing I think you mentioned to GDPR, uh, that, that's really interesting. That thing was 18 years in the making, more or less. Um, so you can imagine that the type of problems people were trying to solve when they started the discussion is simply not any longer the same when the thing was finally enacted. So what, what they tried to solve was certain forms of online marketing, um, cookies and online behavioral advertising. They, they were not thinking of the type of systems you're discussing. So I think you're absolutely right. There is a, a, a sort of time lag that we find in the regulatory space. Um, my understanding is uh, you computer science development people are all into agile computing these days and they faster. We, we never found a way of agile legislation. <laughs> And it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting concept. What would that mean? How would you do that? Um, let regulatory sandboxes, I think, come as close to that as, as one could think. Um, they, they are sort of an overlap between that, but we haven't really thought that problem through. Um, um, so thanks a lot for, 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 for that. Uh, Alan, do you want to um, be our next contributor? Thanks, Parker. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. You guys can hear me. Okay. Um, do new actors need new laws? Uh, is, it, is it comprehensive enough if I just answer yes? <laughs> um, I, I, the, th the thoughts that I've jotted down that I'd like to share with you guys are a little bit of a mix of the, the topic around tools and laws, I think, as, as, as well. So I'll run through them and um, Forgive me if I'm expanding out, out of the remit of just, just the, the, the question. Um, from a law's point of view today, Burkert, you showed on one of the slides, you showed this triangle comparing UK and Australia there, and um, uh, not having developed many vehicles for Australian market, but having developed many vehicles in the UK market, I'm pretty familiar with it. So we, we really have, in, in, the, in the case of, of vehicles on the road, we have, we have two sort of categories of laws. We have the vehicle assurance 
category, which is homologation at the point of design and manufacture, and then the MOT during the life of the vehicle. Now, there are things that have evolved over time to, to make sure that that happens. So we do things like even the technologies that we'll see in automated vehicles, they're building on technologies that have evolved. So take the forward facing camera, for example, we use it for um, uh, uh, cruise control and um, lane keeping features. We have to go through a calibration process of that. So we're checking that and that, that was an evolution. Um, but clearly as we bring more sensors in, we need a way of not only just um, evaluating and uh, uh, standardizing the, the sensor capability at point of manufacture, but also during the service life, it's going to have a de deteriorating performance. So what, what constitutes minimum performance requirements for the vehicle? Um, and the other aspect is driving. So today we have the vehicle and we have the driver and we assess a driver based on uh, what, what you know very well, Burke, the rules of the road, the highway code. And the subjectivity that you find today in the highway code is, is unpalatable from a machine um, interpretation point of view. So um, we, we do it today with a subjective approach. We, we have a drive, driving instructor, a driving examiner, and he assesses the driver. Did the driver uh, comply with the highway code? And the highway code is quite subjective and it's subjective to both the driver and to the, the interpretation of the driving instructor. So there's definitely going to need to be some 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 work uh, done there to at least update what we have today. Um, interestingly, people have talked about scenarios. We talked about them earlier today. Um, I saw uh, Chi Hong, you mentioned scenarios. You even showed some, some um, uh, simulation clips of scenarios. We haven't at the moment, there is no space anywhere in the world where we're using scenarios at the moment to demonstrate that, that we've got, um, we've got full assurance of the safety to launch a vehicle, right? So um, uh, yes, there are, there are cases where we've got automated vehicles coming into service in terms of robo taxis. Waymo's doing it with a, what they call the um, authorized, uh, authorized passenger fleet, which are essentially tr tr trained people and um, Mobileye will do it in Munich, but we don't have scenarios uh, uh, really actually being used in anger. The Ministry of Transport in Germany have, have asked that all data be captured from uh, automated vehicles when they're in a, uh, an incident or an event, a disengagement, for example, and that uh, data will then be used later to build up a greater set of scenarios for testing to go, to go back to. So, so it's essentially a formal, uh, uh, formally requesting that we, we identify the edge cases. Um, and, and that will then also be used I guess from not from from just from a testing point of view, from an AI point of view, it'll be used for training, uh, training data as well. Um, that then leads into with the scenarios that leads into this question that was touched on earlier uh, uh, was um, how safe is safe enough? This this comes up all the time. How safe is safe enough from automated vehicles point of view? And it, it's to do is tied in with the marketing and in, um, perception uh, points that were touched on before. But we're going to have to, I think, see some rules changes around how the data that is collected, what the format of that data is. Because if every um, developer produces their data in different formats, then we're not going to be able to, the authorities are not going to be able to process the data in the, the way that they need to when, when they're looking into events. Uh, when we do that today, we have, you touched on GDPR before, we already have um, face obfuscation and number plate obfuscation so that if you are looking into an event, you can't tie um, the, the presence of somebody there. Now, I've got a colleague who's Chinese national and he just laughs at what we're doing here in Europe. He says, what's, come on, you, 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 if you've got nothing to hide, what's your problem? Uh, the classic Chinese approach, let's record everybody's presence everywhere uh, because there shouldn't be anything to hide and there are evidences that the crime rates in China are particularly low, um, reportedly low. Um, David, you touched on something that I'd like to come back to in the previous conversation. You said it might, the tools, it might not be the tools themselves, it might be the process of using the tools. So I think, Burkard, the, the topic of will we require new laws actually touches not just on the implementation of technology, but the development of the technology. We have in other safety critical environments, we have uh, formalized tool chains, formalized processes, particularly in aerospace, I think we'll see that um, more so in, in um, automated vehicle development. Um, 
I, I think that the using the right tools and the process of using the right tools is going to become a particularly uh, relevant part. The, the automated vehicles that we see today, frankly, were developed by people who wanted to just get going with the functionality. Let's get started. The vehicle can drive by itself. And then later they thought, oh, hold on a minute. If the vehicle goes wrong, what should we do? But the, the correct approach is, imagine there's no um, a human there as a fallback option. The architecture should be, before we even start designing the functionality, the vehicle will go wrong. Something will go wrong. So let's think about what goes wrong first, and then we start to build the framework for the, the functionality that we want. Um, now, we did some work before uh, looking at where the, the problems in fu vehicle functionality come up, and you find that about 20%, typically in most systems, are actually in the requirements capture phase. Errors during the requirements capture lead on to problems in the field when the, when products are actually launched. And um, um, we've got so we, we did some tool development for automated looking at the semantics of engineering requirements because two engineers, two systems engineers sitting next to each other will produce requirements in different formats uh, in different structures and and you you kind of want to get through that. You don't want to go to a 500 page specification document and remember that page 49 and page 272 are in conflict. You want to be able to automate those those aspects. I'm going to stop. That was rather long winded of me. Apologies, but I think I kind of gave yeah. my opinion. Uh, lots of interesting points. I want just one for me to, to pick up on when, when you say this data might then be used later on, for instance, in prosecutions or in um, insurance companies trying to figure out which one has to pay. Um, there you get this jurisdiction problem, even this in the UK. Um, Scott's law with its corroboration rule might require you to record data on the car twice. I have no idea actually how, how corroboration applies to, <laughs> to electronic data. Already on the other side of patrons' wall, you wouldn't have to do that. Um, so so, so um, the, the, the way data is um, validated for, for legal proceedings is um, extremely complex and extremely jurisdiction specific, much, much more than these sort of high level security standards that we saw. Um, and um, finally, um, uh, uh, passing on to, to, uh, uh, to, to, no, not finally, sorry, I'm not even there, to, to Jonathan. Um, and uh, um, yep, we're here. But, yeah, well, it's just excellent. Great, thanks. Um, all right, I assume my audio is good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, uh, I took actually a bunch of notes because uh, all of you said very interesting things, but uh, I thought I'd restart from the initial question, which was uh, do new actors need new laws? And I'm going to have to agree with Alan on that. The answer is yes. And uh, I think it was kind of a, you know, provocative question because oftentimes in the general public there's always that kind of sentiment that you know law is too complicated there's always too many laws and we should simplify everything like politicians love to have grand proclamations about how everything should be synthesized but it's not the way it works right life is complicated and when you look at what's happening in the space right now and especially at this workshop I think what we're observing is that the world evolves there are new areas and there's a um frontier in research for uh, legal thinking, right? At some point, you start looking at a new area, whether it's, as you just mentioned, insurance for self-driving vehicles or maybe privacy laws where everyone is making different attempts with varying degrees of success, like the GDPR or the uh, California Senate that has its own like data privacy law or even like banking regulations for new financial products. There's always in life new areas that need new laws. And whether these are statutory laws or private contracts or just like industry guidelines, there will be new areas and lawyers will be at the frontier. They will try to think of new situations with new entities, new relationships between the entities, new classifications. And I think to me, the problem really isn't new laws. It's about democratizing the laws and their understanding because so many of these laws are no longer within the exclusive purview of legal thinking. When you look at all of the things that have been like the topics that were discussed at this workshop, whether it's like self-driving or privacy, all of these are far ranging problematics beyond the confines of just legal thinking or just one specific industry. And the problem is you need to have all of this legal thinking distilled 
in a way that's understandable by all of the actors involved, whether it's the engineers, the people who make the decisions, the VPs who are going to have to sign off on a self-driving car project somewhere. And to me, it's really a problematic of knowledge transfer that appears when you start thinking about the new actors and the new laws. And as someone who's not legally trained, for me, my main question is, how can we take all of these new areas and kind of capture the essence of what's happening legally in a way that's actionable and understandable by all of these actors. And that's something that I like very much have at the top of my mind and for which I don't have a slam dunk answer, but hey, it's research. And it's, it's, it's also quite interesting, again, when, when I started uh, in, in Edinburgh a long, long time ago, 1996, um, there was just at that point a big discussion in the legal academic field in particular, if IT law was a subject that should be taught as a, a separate subject. And, uh, the, the, and the emotions went extremely high on that. There was a famous uh, contribution by a Chuck Easterbrook in the US uh, who said, there can't be such a thing as IT law. After all, we also don't have the law of the horse. It's way too specialist. Uh, we have dealing the court law, we should have criminal law, but we shouldn't have, we don't have the law of the horse. And IT law is just like the law of the horse. It's a minority interest. It will all go away in five years. It will blow over. Uh, and, and Larry Lessig at the time responded to that and said, oh, yeah, you're right. We don't have the law of the horse, but um, IT law is going to be something that applies to all fields of law. It, it requires its own field of knowledge. It requires different types of thinking about legislation. So it was a big discussion. And uh, when, when I read that at, at the time, and I always have been legal historian by hobby at least, said, so this is totally wrong. I mean, both of you are, are arguing from the wrong perspective because in Edinburgh, we were actually teaching the law of the horse as a separate course up to 1910. <laughs> and I've seen the textbook in our library. There are textbooks that said, this is the law of the horse, um, which is, makes perfect sense if you think how important horses were for society. Uh, that was the key method of transport. And I'm, I'm saying this here because obviously um, <laughs> autonomous cars are, are in a way um, the new horses. Um, <laughs> they are autonomous. They are very often not quite as intelligent as, 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 as horses. Um, they, they, the, the one difference is um, my horse wouldn't go to the police and pull up out where I was, which is an <laughs> autonomous car <laughs> I'm not so sure about. Um, but, but I, do, I do think, I mean, on the one hand, I totally agree with you. There is a danger by very conservative legal profession to push back against new fields, uh, new, new ways of doing it. But, but I do sometimes think there is also something to be gained to, to ask, where did we have that type of problem before? And uh, especially, again, with, with horses, where people had to be told, oh, sorry, you don't approach it from behind. And if you get at a slap of the back, and you get kicked, then sorry, that's your fault. Um, because yes, this thing is autonomous. It makes its own decisions and it doesn't normally like to get slapped on the back. And the same type of adjustment of behavior might also be something required from humans in an autonomous vehicle space that they just have to learn uh, to refrain from sorts of behavior. So on the one hand, I very much sympathize with, with, with uh, the point and there is a danger that lawyers push back against that. But uh, I, I do think there are sometimes some interesting and unexpected historical lessons uh, that, that we can, can learn as well. Part of that um, pushback that I saw when doing mm -hmm. some of the review work is the fact that you get then prosecutors who don't want to admit that there's IT law or hacking law. And so what they do is they go and look for another statute that's on the books and end up <laughs> prosecuting um, you know, one case they end up prosecuting somebody for stalking mm. um, when you know it was it was clearly a a cyber law hacking issue. Yeah. So, and, um, yeah, and, and yeah, definitely in, in that sense, in, in a problematic space, we are at the moment risking that some judges try to squeeze modern problems into categories, and they are definitely sometimes not appropriate. Stalking is, I think, a good good example of certain things. Were hardly fitted, but not totally. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, hacking was originally back in the 90s prosecuted. Was, what, what was it? Uh, trespass into seclusion? Yes. The analogy was someone climbing over your fence and uh, uh, have company in your garden. This just doesn't work. And then they, they realized quite quickly that that was not 
that we needed new um, cyber uh, crime laws in particular. Um, passing on now really to the last one, sorry, <laughs> Peter, um, you, you are not forgotten. Uh, Peter, can you um, unmute and uncloak? Peter, actually, on both panels. <laughs> But by mistake, we put Peter in both panels. So, Peter, uh, if you if you uh, want to decline, uh, please feel free. Uh, we, we meant to to put you either in either, but put them both in there. No, no, it's fine. And in fact, in 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 many ways, I can just read the um, read the comment that I put in the chat just now. <clears throat> So, so I, I do somewhat agree that new actors possibly need, need new laws sometimes, but the question is, is usually why. So, so in looking at this, um, for instance, in the automatic car area and things of this nature, um, we, we had a lot of this discussion. Um, and, and I think in the context of, of here where you're looking at AI systems and things of, this, things of that nature, um, what was what was interesting about this was was it prosecutable well actually yes it was prosecutable yeah that wasn't a problem it really goes to what Burkhar was just was just just um talking about yeah so if i kill somebody a legal entity is going to be held responsible for it's not that you go i've written an automatic system and therefore nobody can be prosecuted for this yeah we'll find somebody to hold responsible and that's that's essentially in the same in the same area of, of um, yeah, that's the joint and severally liable sort of thing. If you kill somebody, we're all liable. What we then do is start arguing about why it's not my responsibility or I'm less responsible or I did the right sorts of things. So um, it goes into that misconception that uh, that that um, that misconception that, for instance, if I did a good safety case, I'm not liable. That's not true. If you kill somebody, you're liable. What you've done is mitigated that, so you've taken reasonable actions in relation to that. What we started to discuss in relation to cybersecurity was, okay, so there's an equation that goes with this that, you know, if I kill one person and I'd actually taken all reasonable things, there's all sorts of health and safety you know, acts and things of this nature that come into place that show I was doing the right stuff. But if I knew in the face of cyber attacks, the likely outcome was a catastrophic thing where everybody's brakes stopped working simultaneously. That wasn't a, that wasn't a defense. So that it wasn't, this wasn't being treated as a one at a time. You'd be treated as knowingly doing stuff that was negligent. Um, and it basically fell into either I was negligent or I was not skilled enough to be doing my job. Um, either of which was a prosecutable set of things in relation to that. So, the observation we then came to was trying to differentiate when you were talking about new laws. There are different types of laws. So the principles that sit behind these things are reasonably unchanging principles. Yeah, and the principles aren't changing. What you're looking at is how does society embed those principles into its legal frameworks to allow you to do this and whether there is something different. So there was this tendency to say we need new laws for, you know, we need new laws for automatic cars. And that wasn't the case. What you need is new clause that adequately re readjust some of the liabilities and allow, and allow some defences. So if you look at the aircraft industry, the ability to make a defence that even though it is probably the case that if I put AI systems in there, these things would have been safer because they do a better job than the pilot does, I'm not legally allowed to do so. So, so I'm allowed to defend why I didn't do that on the basis that the law prevented me from doing so. So I think one of the things that you're looking at here is, is not just a do I need new laws, you're looking at, yeah, because okay, yes, you need new laws, but or you may need new laws. But the, the really important discussion you're having is what would that mean? And why would that be? Why would that be societally tolerable? And will that have the right effects when you try and do those sorts of things? So what we saw was an awful lot of people saying, I have done industry good practice in relation to cyber. Absolutely. And you still knew it was going to fail. So why do you want to transfer from your liability to somebody else? Yeah. What is your justification for doing that kind of stuff? So that element of having that decision and, and allowing that discussion between there, that's why I think things like the tools and understanding what they actually achieve, what can actually be claimed and making sure that people don't 
Um, don't overestimate what they're able to do. Those have to be embedded into legal, legal frameworks. And there's a reason why judges are called judges. It's because they make judgments on these sorts of things. And that aspect of judgment has been, has been said by a number of the other uh, panelists here. That seems to me a really important thing. So before we start asking for new laws, the first thing we need to understand is what was it we thought we were doing that justified these new laws? And why do we think liabilities need to be adjusted? I guess the other point that I'd like to make is the, this one of interconnected stuff. So the really serious thing from the point of view of a VW when they had the problem in relation to the, to, to the diesel bait stuff, oddly, isn't the isn't the, the the problem with respect to to the to the diesel gate stuff? It's the lying to the financial markets. You know that the world takes a very dim view of people misrepresenting things to the financial markets. That's what sends people to jail. That's criminal. Where other things were were sitting in the civil cases, as as it were. So this actual understanding of what it is we think we're claiming turns out to be much more important. Yeah, than it at first appears, because whereas up until now, most of the computer science things that we've done have been done in areas that do not matter and fit under contract law. So if you go to the front of Microsoft license, and I'm not picking on them, yeah, because it basically says don't use this for anything you care about. Yeah, the point is, as soon as you start getting into areas where you're where you're talking about things that will kill people, the safety areas, you don't get to say, you know, to opt out of the consequences. So you can't contract out of the consequences in relation to these sorts of things. Somebody is going to be bearing them. That I think is a really important area. The things we're now talking about, we can either we can either continue to do trivial things, in which case, why do we have these conferences and why do we do this research? Or we're going to step up and do the things that matter, in which case this aspect of of it being something that matters and therefore it's going to fit out the things you can't contract out of is going to become, I think, a much more um, a much more pressing element under the law. And one of the things that we have not fully recognised yet in, in, in what we're in what we're doing. Uh, and I think we need to. So do you need do you need new laws? I think you need to understand first how the existing laws apply and could be applied. And I do think we need to avoid a situation in which we in which we allow the lawyers to set you know, what technical standards are, because actually precedent is set in court. Uh, and that is the one thing that I caution about and have cautioned about for some time. If you get a successful prosecution that demonstrates that somebody doing an automatic vehicle, for instance, did not have a clue of what they were doing and was liable, that is retrospectively active into every other, every other person that did the same thing. So I, th I think that isn't something we've come to terms with when we've applied our research and things into these things. That's that was, I guess, my 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 view. Right. It's, it's interesting. It also sort of re resonates for me with, with another spin I could have given on that on that question. Do we need a different type of law? Or do we need a different type of lawyers? Uh, and I think it's interesting that you mentioned contract law here in opposition to some of these other forms. The one thing contract lawyers are good at is to be forward looking. A good contract lawyer, good transactional lawyers will draft a contract that is watertight and will not create a new issue. Um, all the other fields of law, criminal lawyers in particular, they come in when something has already gone wrong. Um, they are always looking backwards. Um, and I think we, we need this forward looking element more. And GDPR, data protection by design is a sort of prime example, but I think it becomes more important generally to move away a little bit from that perspective, that um, your only concern is an individual case in which something went wrong. Of course, that also blinds you from these wider social issues that, that Peter, you just mentioned. I'm almost not worried about that. I'm not trained to think along these lines because my duties are to what my one client who has this one individual event and that is the, the borders of my um, requirement. So, so I always feel it's, it's less important maybe even to teach lawyers of technology than to teach them more of a mindset of, 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 of a technologist in, in, in that sense of anticipating issues more um, rather than expecting that the facts are there. It's, it's one unique historical event. Could, could I put one other pink thing in there? Because I know this will resonate with Scott or, or should resonate with Scott. <laughs> 
So, so, so if you look at the regulations, the UNECE regulations and the requirements to have a management plan in place for cyber security um, in relation to, you know, for, for your vehicles and being able to do all those sorts of things. And everybody's rushing to put a management plan into place in relation to this and to, to show that because that's the regulation. However, if you look at the stats, we're expecting quarter of a million cyber incidents over, an, over the eight year lifetime of a vehicle, many of which will in some way at least have to be analysed in order to determine they don't have a safety implication. So if you look at the management plans, how many of these are scaled to be able to handle with quarter of a million safety incidents over eight years? And if they're not, then precedent would seem to suggest that the contractual liabilities will be set aside because you don't have a management plan. So, uh, uh, Mark, can I stop in quickly just for a quick point? I mean, uh, I the only thing I want to mention is that uh, I, I mean, I see Peter's point about expressing nuance uh, in this uh, kind of dichotomy of using old laws versus uh, creating new ones. But I do disagree with him uh, on the whole, however, in, in the fact that uh, if you think about something like face recognition, right, we have had this technology at least till 1980s. Nobody cared about it. People often push it under contractual law, as Peter pointed out, with many other tools that you can find on the web. But now uh, face recognition has taken a kind of devious direction, uh, uh, A, in surveillance and so on, but that's an uh, application problem. But even in the fact that there is a, in a, in a, an imbalance in the data collected about face recognition means that you know, certain minorities and other kinds of uh, discrimination patterns tend to emerge and uh, and people have just not you know the technologists for, certainly for instance have just let this slide by and this is why i think we need lawyers who are forward thinking looking at these kinds of applications and the ways these things get applied to step in and say you know what it's fine that you think you're doing science but you know unless you have a clear goal of how this could potentially benefit society uh, these are dangerous applications that could come out of your uh, of your technology deep fake is another instance right this kind of just swept in uh, out of the blue with all of the, uh, all of the uh, advances in guns and people were kind of stumped at, and now for instance because of deep fakes it becomes impossible to hold the video as uh, substantial evidence in court right Right? Uh, so I think this is another instance where, uh, uh, you know, legislators certainly could potentially step in and stop technologists kind of taking over and is you, I mean, it's fine to do kind of an academic development, I think, but there needs to be certain regulatory practices in place uh, to stop people from just abusing, you know, uh, privacy and uh, using disproportionate uh, population sizes to kind of have, uh, you know, overreaching uh, uh, you know, overreaching effects in society, I think. Uh, anyway, I appreciate Peter's point uh, that you do need nuance, but nonetheless, I do think uh, that lawyers need to be somewhere in there to kind of provide that kind of moral and ethical angle to the development and use of technology. Um, Jonathan? Um, uh, I, yeah, I just wanted to add that I very much agree with uh, Vaishak in the sense that um, in many ways, legislation is reactive and no one is omniscient and can forecast potentially nefarious applications of a given technology. And yes, I agree that oftentimes there's like a framework or base default laws that are supposed to deal with this general case. But when you have something like, I don't know, um, I don't know, glasses with, you know, cameras on them seemed like a good idea and a really cool technological gadget. And no one could have forecast in the beginning that this would be such a privacy nightmare, right? And it became apparent quite quick. But as far as I know, big companies were betting on it and could not forecast that it would be such a nightmare and such a disaster. So there is like it's the legal thinking is bound to evolve. And it's a very dynamic thing, in my opinion, where you have to react, adapt and kind of provide answers according to, of course, what society desires for some things that could not be forecast early on. And I think it's inevitable that there will be a frontier of legal thinking that kind of always produces new ideas, new frameworks and new laws for whatever new crazy things come up in just life. But that's also, I think, an interesting, different way to link the spectrum. Um, and I totally agree with him. One of the problems with these management plans and also with um, data privacy impact assessments is very often they are not scaled. 
they, they assume that your startup remains always as small as it was. And then they get totally overwhelmed and they suddenly pull oh, and behold, you're popular and get more customers. Uh, and, and the same, I think, will happen with the service the potential with the cyber security management plans. And one of the problems I think we persistently see is some problems only really appear when things get scaled and they get widespread. I mean, deep fakes has been a perfectly fine technology as long as a small group of responsible Hollywood filmmakers were in control of it and, and they're doing avatar. Well, that, that didn't require regulation. Technology didn't require regulation. Suddenly, when every um, under socialized 18 year old in mom's basement had access to the technology, then we suddenly saw the problem emerging. So, so I do think there's a specific challenge here for regulators. Again, to, to think outside the paradigm case where you have one victim, one perpetrator, and you don't have to worry about questions of scale towards the question, what happened if that is scaled, if it becomes more prominent? But again, this is, this, this is an old lesson. We, we had to legislate for denial of service attacks, not because they were new, but suddenly because there were more of them and they became bigger. And that's when, when new criminal law was specifically introduced um, to deal with that. So that issue of scalability, I think is quite, quite difficult. And again, requires a different way to think about laws and, and a different format of, of, of legislation than um, the one we, we, we have at the moment. I, I was indicated to me that someone behind me. Yeah, was. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. And, then, and then I think we're out of time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, that, yeah. that will be very, very No, it's quick, not to you, right? it's, well, it's to, to the chair. It's my, okay. my chair, not to you. Know. I just wanted to say that uh, from you know the trenches of practice and being in it for a while, I have to agree with Alan on this one. And as a typical lawyer answer, I think everyone is right and everyone is wrong too. Um, for example, when you're talking about the deep fakes, now we could create new laws, but as we know, law is slow by design. Law is, you know, based on the societal agreements of public policy we've all come to. It shocks me that my cockapoo is going to say wolf, okay, after, after so many permutations. And if we look back, we had some of these things, like with the deep fakes, for example, um, even though it became a completely perverted area of law, false light could easily be adapted if we changed it, which was an old, old law that unfortunately became one that was used uh, for homophobic purposes down the road. But that is almost a perfect vehicle for deep fakes. And if we look back at those types of laws, I think that as instead of new laws, we just have to look at them as evolved laws. And with technology today, there are so many more things we can be doing. It does not have to be criminal or it's retrospective. Why are we not beta testing these laws of tech? Hmm. We have the populace, we have the gamers. We could easily do it and give bounties for the most successful criminals in the game so we can force all outside. There's so much more new things that we can do with this tech. And I'm sorry we're out of time. Don't give a lawyer <laughs> an open mic. Um, but I just wanted to jump in and say that. Was okay, fun. excellent. On that happy note, we will all use AI to become better criminals. Was I think was it was it a take home message? Should be noted. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like that. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right now.